of this is you want to look at what's called the cognitive conscious and cognitive unconscious. Because when we get information, we process it in very different ways depending on what type of information it is and what we're going to do with it. Now there's a whole other science behind it, motivation and all sorts of other things, which you don't have to worry about in this class. But what is it that we're really talking about? The cognitive unconscious. Information that you know but are not accessing at the current moment. In other words, you're not conscious of it. It's knowledge that you already have. Right? It's what you learned, hopefully, in your classes in the spring that you're not thinking of right at this moment. It's things like knowing how to ride a bicycle. You don't have to think about it. But that knowledge is there. Now you do have some control in making unconscious thoughts conscious. That's called something simple, called remembering. So if I ask you, what did you eat for breakfast this morning? Who remembers what you ate for breakfast this morning? Who was thinking of it before I asked you that question? One, two people. You must be really hungry. You need more breakfast. That's an example of bringing the unconscious to the conscious. And then, of course, there's the cognitive conscious. This is information that you are currently aware of and using, so you're conscious of it. Yeah, so the breakfast that I asked you to think about, you're now conscious of your breakfast. Here's the thing you want to remember. Even though we don't have some control over making unconscious thoughts conscious, we cannot deliberately make conscious thoughts unconscious. I can tell you, you know, don't think about the fact that there's a projector over here. Now don't think about that. Who's being successful? <laughs> One person. You're either really, really good or I need to work on those things more. <laughs> All right, so there are different levels of control when it comes to the conscious and the unconsciousness. Different levels of capabilities. Do you think this is going to make a difference in interface design? I hope you're saying yes, except I don't want to tell you because I think it's going to be wrong. Actually, yes, the answer to that is absolutely. How we operate on information is very different, and that's going to make an effect on how we design our interfaces. Cognitive consciousness operates sequentially. Right? We are conscious of only between four and eight distinct thoughts at once. It's not as expansive as some people seem to believe. And conscious memory fades in at most a few seconds. It does not last very long. Now here's something that I want you to really remember when it comes to consciousness that a lot of students tend to forget. The consciousness is very good at handling branching tasks. What are those? Basically making decisions. Raskin talks about making decisions between two, two actions, two tasks. We actually can be three tasks or four tasks. You have to have that information in your awareness to make a decision and to reason about it. But we also have a tendency to do something that can be good or bad, which is we form habits. Right, we all have our habits. With repetition, a conscious branching task may become unbranching and automatic. In other words, it becomes a habit. Think about when you drive. When you first drove, what were you doing? Pay, yeah, you're paying attention to everything. My hands are on the wheel. My foot is on the gas. Right? Oh, wait, am I in gear? Yes. Okay, I have to remember to look in my mirrors every uh, however many seconds it's supposed to be. Oh, wait, where's my turn signal? Now how do you drive? Getting a drive. Right? Well, hopefully you're not texting, but some people are like, yeah, I'm texting as I'm driving. Not a good idea, by the way. Are we thinking about how we're placing our hands on the steering wheel? No. Even are we thinking about whether we're using our turn signals? Yeah, in Miami, you know, in Florida, yeah, nobody uses turn signals. Actually, you find the people that use turn signals either are worried about their driving or they turned it into a habit. 
And usually if they turn into the, ha the habit, sometimes you'll see that they put their turn signal on just because the road curves. Have you seen that? I've done that. <laughs> my husband, what are you doing? Uh, I happen to use my turn signals. I'm an anomaly. Actually, I learned that when I lived in Texas. Everyone uses turn signals there. They're very weird. All right, so you want to remember that things that we are, are learning, for example, are in our consciousness. Once it's learned, it may become automatic. Yes? That's a little bit more simplistic to make a habit. A habit usually tends to be a sequence of actions. So in, you know, in that case, you know, there, you know, there are people in the military, for example, who get themselves into to the habit of scanning their environment every, I don't know, 10 seconds, however long, um, where initially you do have to you know, pay attention and prompt yourself to do that. I suppose you could do the same thing with every 10 seconds I'm going to notice whether there's a projector or not. I'm not sure why you do that, I, but I would suppose it's, you know, it's possible, and that could be considered a habit. But generally, that's not something you would do. It's more things such as driving. That's a great question. I've never gotten that question before. All right, so I have a nice table. This makes a fabulous midterm exam question where we're comparing the conscious and unconscious. So the conscious tends to be engaged by novelty, things that are new, things we haven't seen before. So if I'm standing here lecturing and someone opens the door and slams the door, that's not something you're used to in this class. That could be considered novel. Most of the people will turn around and look. Emergencies. Right? You're driving along in your car. Someone runs a stop sign in front of you. Suddenly you notice. Danger. Actually, I used that in my last example. Oh my God, my car is going to get squished. You're not thinking about, of course, I may be in the hospital. You're worried about your car. Right? Those are the things that can really just grasp our attention. The unconscious is engaged by repetition, expected events, when you're feeling safe. So if we look at our car example, right, we feel completely comfortable as we're getting in the car and driving along. All right, I'm driving home. It's natural. It's in my unconscious, but I still know how to do it. The consciousness tends to be used more in new circumstances, with, whether the unconscious is more used in routine circumstances. The consciousness can handle decisions. The unconscious handles non-branching tasks. The unconscious is not the one that's making the decisions. It's not reasoning about information. I'm not talking about like an immediate reaction. I'm talking about being able to process information. The consciousness accepts logical propositions. The unconscious will accept logical propositions or inconsistencies. Now you're probably wondering what that is, right? Let me give you an example that's the most common. There are a lot of times where people have various religious beliefs that are inconsistent with their behavior. Does that make sense? Well, we know what happens, right? The unconscious, when they are behaving in a way that's inconsistent with their religious beliefs, they're not thinking about it. It's in their unconscious. There's a whole science behind all of that also, by the way. Very interesting. It's not just religious beliefs. That's the one that people, most people can relate to. The consciousness operates sequentially. The unconscious simultaneously. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. The consciousness the controls are volition. You have control over it. The unconscious is more habits, automatic responses. The capacity of the consciousness is teeny, teeny, tiny compared to the unconsciousness. In fact, we actually don't even know what the capacity of the unconsciousness is. Now, some of you will say, well, yeah, but I've seen stories where they say that the brain is 10 bazillion terabytes. I don't know. What Right? That's actually an estimation based on computer modeling. We have no way to actually test that to see if it's true. 
We can't really say how big it is. We don't know. And consciousness persists for as little as tenths of a second. Unconsciousness, arguably, can last an entire lifetime, depending on the information. 